Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you may be joining us from today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CIFA York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the first session of the Drones for Public Health, Safety, Risk, Humanitarian, and Emergency Management Speaker Series, presented in partnership with York University's Advanced Disaster and Emergency Rapid Response Lab and the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology Center for Innovation and Research in Unmanned Systems. I would like to begin today's session with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Toronto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the huron Mandat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that the territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, our participants may be joining from various locations, so I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. For those who may not be familiar with CFL York, our center was established in 2020 and started its operations in 2021. CFL York was created in collaboration between the United Nations Institute of Training and Research, or UNITART, and York University with York Region to develop and deliver training, knowledge, training and knowledge sharing, as well as capacity building programs across five focus areas, which are disaster risk, emergency management and humanitarian actions, health development, environment and climate change, entrepreneurship, digital technology, and economic development, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Michelle Arif. Michelle is a research staff and geospatial analyst at the Center of Innovation and Research into Unmanned Systems at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. She holds a master's degree in disaster and emergency management from Royal Worlds University, as well as an applied bachelor's in geographic information systems from SAITE, and an undergraduate degree from the University of Toronto. Her research interests focus on how climate change influences disaster patterns and how emerging technologies such as drones can aid in disaster mitigation efforts. Additionally, Michelle actively volunteers with the Canadian Red Cross, contributing to the emergency response team and personal disaster assistance programs. Michelle, thank you very much for moderating today's session. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Francesco. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone that's joining us here today, and thank you for taking the time to learn with us today. I'm very excited to be opening this series called Drones for Public Health, Safety, Risk and Emergency Management, and Humanitarian Response. My name again is Michelle Arif, and I'll be your moderator for this series. Uh, just a quick few things to note, the chat box below is open that I'm seeing people typing in. It's great to have some communal dialogue. This is a learning uh, group. And I also encourage all participants to type in any questions they may have in the Q&A box, which I will monitor throughout the webinar and probably get to questions at the end of Stephanie's talk. As someone that's deeply involved in the field of drone technology and particularly in its application within disaster and emergency management, I'm thrilled to kick off today's conversation, which focuses on one of the most vital yet complex aspects of drone operations, laws and regulations. In this rapidly evolving world of drones, their potential to revolutionize public health, safety risk, and emergency management is immense, from aiding in search and rescue operations to supporting wildfire management, flood mitigation, and even humanitarian response in crisis zones, drones have become an indispensable tool for collecting real-time data, delivering aid, and ensuring faster and more informed decision-making. However, with this transformative potential comes the responsibility of ensuring safe, ethical, and legal drone use, especially in environments where lives and critical resources are at stake. Today's session is dedicated to the legal and regulatory framework surrounding drone operations. As many of you know, operating drones, especially in sensitive or high-risk environments, requires a thorough understanding of laws governing airspace, privacy concerns, and safety protocols. Compliance with regulations is not just about staying on the right side of the law, but it's also about ensuring that we can continue the safe use of drones in the public space while minimizing risks to individuals, communities, and responders in the field. I've witnessed firsthand the critical importance of adhering to these regulations, whether it's obtaining the proper certifications for complex operations or understanding the nuanced permissions needed for flights in restricted airspaces. 
uh, regulatory, sorry, the regulatory landscape can either empower or constrain the capabilities of drone teams and first responders. That's why it's so important for us to stay up to date. Uh, this brings me to our speaker for today, Stephanie Lapointe. Stephanie holds an Applied Bachelor's in Geographic Information System from the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. She also holds a Bachelor of Commerce in Finance and a Bachelor of Science in Geography, both from the University of Calgary. Stephanie will provide, Stephanie is also an Operations Manager and Researcher at the Center for Innovation and Research in Unmanned Systems at SAIT, where she spent over seven years working in the field of RPAS technology. She has a strong background in GIS and extensive, extensive experience in managing both operational and regulatory aspects of drone development. There's so many hats that Stephanie holds. She also holds a Transport Canada Advanced Operations RPAS pilot certificate with a flight reviewer rating, which allows her to train and certify other drone operators. She also serves as a primary liaison between Cirrus and Transport Canada, where she ensures that the proper approvals are in place for complex RPAS missions. This combination of technical and regulatory expertise gives her a unique perspective on how to navigate the laws that govern drone operations, particularly in challenging dynamic environments. Stephanie is the perfect person to guide us through this first session on legal and practical considerations. And with that said, I'm delighted to introduce Stephanie. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining me. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for the great introduction. Um, so I will go ahead and start sharing my screen. Bear with me here a second. So um, as Michelle mentioned, uh, I work at the Center for Innovation and Research in Unmanned Systems here at SAIT. Um, and I have been in this drone space for, for quite a few years now um, and have kind of carved my way um, as our, our regulatory person here um, at our lab. Um, uh, I did want to start off and give you a little bit of an overview of who is Cirrus, uh, the Center for Innovation Research and Unmanned Systems, um, and what it is we do. Um, so we are part of uh, a larger portion of SAIT, uh, the research arm, which is called Applied Research and Innovation Services. Uh, and as our name suggests, uh, our group uh, does specifically work with drones. Um, and our mission is to facilitate collaboration between SAIT and industry partners in the area of remotely piloted aircraft systems and to act as an applied research partner to help organizations integrate our, our pass into their workflow. So what I like to explain it as is essentially you know, we have uh, an industry partner. They're like, you know what? I think the drones might uh, really work uh, for some part of our operations, but we're not really sure. Um, you know, I hear that those guys at SAIT, uh, they know what they're doing. So maybe we'll go talk to them and, and try to figure out if, if this is gonna work for us. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what we do. Um, but the main focus of this series, of course, is about emergency uh, management and disaster relief and that sort of stuff. Um, as I'm sure we're all aware, there's a million different uses uh, for drones in this space. Um, I decided I'd list out a few of kind of the popular ones. So some things that drones can be used for um, real time situational awareness. Um, so for example, uh, we're talking about uh, recently a lot of the hurricanes that have gone through Florida recently and all the destruction that has happened there. Um, sometimes um, placing a drone up uh, just to see uh, what exactly is going on before sending people on the ground uh, is a great uh, way to use drones. Also stuff like, for example, imagine um, you have an oil tanker uh, train line, uh, you know, it uh, derails, um, lots of stuff spilled. Um, we can use drones to go in and determine uh, if the air quality is safe before we send people in. Um, other things like post-disaster reconstruction and recovery um, after things like wildfires, um, hurricanes, tornadoes, anything like that. Uh, wildfire and fire monitoring and suppression. Um, we can use things like thermal imaging um, to view um, hot spots, um, and we'll go more into stuff like that. Medical supply delivery is a big 
uh, project that state has been working on for a number of years. Um, so, uh, and I know that some of uh, the other speakers in the series will be talking quite a bit about this one, um, but uh, being able to uh, deliver uh, supplies to um, either remote communities or, uh, you know, uh, in a search and rescue type situation, um, uh, using drones in that sort of situation has, been, has proven to be very valuable. Um, and then, you know, emergency services, uh, more and more um, RCMP uh, detachments and police uh, services and fire uh, have been using our pass in their operations just because of the the benefits of it. Um, so I just wanted to share with you a video um, that uh, I talked about uh, with the medical supplies um, that I mentioned and some of the work that Cirrus has been doing. So um, I know Wade's on the call. Uh, I thought I'd share this for you. It gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're up to here at Cirrus. using a, a drone like the Swiss drone with lots of redundancy, lots of uh, very high-end safety measures. And we're trying to utilize that system in eventually a beyond visual line of sight environment where we can fly from a lab in Calgary or Cochrane and actually fly to a remote community such as Estonia, Dakota. This was a demonstration project to be able to show that the swabs that are used, the nasopharyngeal swabs or the, the throat swabs that are used for testing for COVID-19 can be sent up via drone in virtually any type of conditions. Specimens can then be reloaded into the drone and then the drone uh, flown back to a laboratory location so that the testing could be done. Morley is not very far from Calgary, but I mean, we can utilize this technology to deliver some PPEs uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic that we have going on. And also some, we can use this technology to transport swabs if needed from, from our community to the provincial lab. And even like in other areas in future, if we expand it, uh, it can be used to deliver medications and other stuff to, to the communities. We are hoping to prove the concept that we can deliver a uh, portable ultrasound system by drone and thereafter I'm able to remotely mentor a person to take that ultrasound out of the drone, assemble it, and thereafter conduct a self-mentored examination of themselves. The, the whole thought behind doing this for COVID-19 is that uh, people can self-isolate and the a sterile ultrasound can be delivered to them. They can self-diagnose and even self-monitor. The opportunities for drone delivery of uh, both diagnostic equipment, of, of uh, medical equipment, of life-saving medications, the sky is the limit. Be it First Nations peoples, be it people who are, are, are trekking in the Canadian North or in other wilderness settings, or we've got uh, people who are working in remote camps. There's an injury that occurs, uh, life-saving medication and or equipment can be immediately droned up to a site. It opens up tremendous opportunities uh, to be able to provide medical care where it could not have been delivered previously. So um, as I mentioned, uh, just one of the many things that we're doing um, in this emergency space, and as you saw from the video, um, it started off with a COVID-19 type um, scenario, um, and that has definitely morphed into, um, as Andy in the video had mentioned, um, doing uh, telementoring um, patients. If you have some, uh, you know, a hiker that, that falls uh, and is, is injured and stuck in the wilderness, being able to provide them with life-saving measures and, and some uh, telementoring to help them, um, you know, uh, better chance of survival. Um, so that's just one of the great things that we're doing. Uh, but there's lots of uh, great examples uh, in the news of drones in emergency response. For example, um, we have 
um, some police de, uh, departments that are responding to 911 calls first with uh, with drones. Um, oops. Um, wildfire, I think I went, no. Uh, wildfire, as I mentioned, is a big one. Uh, wildfire uh, has a, a lot of great uses because um, with uh, wildfire, um, we usually normally used, uh, use um, crude aviation, so helicopters. Uh, but the thing about wildfires is, is that helicopters are only able to um, fly during the day. Uh, once the night comes, um, the uh, crude aviation is grounded um, just because it's just not safe um, for the pilots on board uh, to be flying in these smoky uh, areas uh, in the dark. Um, so uh, wildfires can change uh, drastically overnight because you don't have that same, you don't have the water bombers going out there um, in the same situational awareness. Um, so that's where drones have been coming in because uh, we don't mind if they go and fly out at night. Um, no one there to, to get uh, uh, injured. Uh, if the drone comes down, well, that's, that's unfortunate, um, but uh, it is what it is. Um, and again, we have a lot of different sensors that can help us map wildfires so that you know we can provide um, maps for the ground crew and the air crew the following morning to show how the wildfire has progressed overnight. Um, we also have uh, thermal imaging to be able to see hot spots, hot spots that maybe are not um, visible um, from the ground. Um, but with great, um, great good also comes great uh, despair sometimes, and this is where we get into regulations. Um, so whenever we're talking about um, disaster and emergency management, we have to remember that there are um, people that are uh, in charge of that that management. It's it's management, right? Um, so we have someone that's in charge of coordinating all sorts of emergency efforts, and if you have somebody with a drone, uh, you know, they I'm sure they most of the time have great intentions. Um, you know, again, we, we think about like the hurricane, you know, people going out with their drones, trying to uh, search for survivors, great intentions. Um, but the problem is, is it does uh, interfere with manned aviation, um, crude aviation, sorry. <laughs> um, and I've got some examples here uh, in the news of, and I'm sure we've all heard about it, about uh, drones causing some mischief as well. Um, so this is the kind of the part that where everybody is trying to really get out uh, to the masses um, what the regulations are with regards to drones, because while you think you might be helping, uh, you might actually be hindering uh, rescue efforts. So for example, at the beginning of September, uh, Stars Air Ambulance wasn't able to land at the site of a large car crash uh, in Manitoba. Uh, because someone was flying their drone. Um, unfortunately, in this case, um, the person died. Uh, uh, thankfully, not due to the, the uh, delay in stars arriving, um, but it just definitely brings to forefront um, that this, this could have been a very different situation. You know, there could have been somebody that was in desperate need for uh, that air ambulance and, um, you know, the ambulance wouldn't be able to land um, because uh, a drone hitting a helicopter and having that fall out of the air uh, with everyone on board would be disastrous. Um, this also, I mean, this happens all over the world. Obviously, this is not just a Canadian issue. Um, here's uh, something from the BBC um, showing in uh, the UK where in 2022, there were 13 cases of emergency services helicopters um, uh, where uh, drones were interfering with their operations. Um, and then, you know, uh, wildfires uh, here in Alberta, we've unfortunately been dealing with a lot of really large wild wildfires over the last several years. Um, and you tend to get people that some people just want to get really cool photos of um, the incident. Uh, some people are want to check on their houses to see if they're okay. But again, um, the helicopters can't fly when there's drones in the area and we need those helicopters for stuff like water bombing. Um, so you'll see stuff like Alberta wildfire um, putting out um, 
different ads on on Facebook and Instagram and all sorts of uh, social media trying to get that word out. Um, and, and a good example was uh, in Jasper National Park this year, uh, devastating fire there. Um, and there was our pass in the area causing issues. So that being said, um, and firefighters again, um, we'll get a little bit into the regulations because your best uh, way to kind of uh, do things legally is to know the regulations. Um, so uh, regulations in Canada are um, created and enforced by Transport Canada. So the same uh, government arm that also deals with uh, cars and trains and, and airplanes, uh, they also have a section of their Canadian aviation regulations um, specifically for drones. And that's uh, called CARS Part 9. Um, so it's all about drones. Who, uh, it tells us who can fly them, where they can fly them, what they can fly. Um, and it's a wealth of information. Uh, there are four basic types of operations when it comes to our pass operations in Canada. Uh, we have basic operations, uh, advanced operations, something that's called special flight operations, and I'm going to go into all of these for you. Um, and then we have a little special category for micro drones. Um, so let's uh, take a look here um, on how things are kind of uh, separated in, in Canada. So essentially, um, uh, we're looking at risk, um, and the more risk uh, there is, the, obviously, the more regulations there are, the more kind of hoops you have to jump through. Um, and um, so we'll start with the, the lowest risk one, which is those micro remotely piloted aircraft. Um, these are ones that weigh less than 250 grams. So you can get them at, you know, your local Best Buy or Costco. Um, and, you know, they usually fit in the palm of your hand. Uh, but the important number is that they weigh less than 250 grams. So technically they have to be 249 grams. And that includes all the accessories that are attached to them. The thing about these micro drones is that they're getting better and better every year. Um, you know, we have 4K cameras on them. Um, you know, the price point is relatively cheap as a drone goes, um, and they're super easy to fly. Um, so great um, opportunity for everyone to uh, kind of get into um, flying uh, remotely piloted aircraft. Um, the thing about micro drones is, is that they're not subject to the majority of that part nine of cars. Um, so you don't have to register your aircraft. You don't need to have a pilot certificate. Um, they're a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, go ahead and, and give this a try. And the reason for that, again, is they're so small. Um, even if something like that were to hit um, an airplane, um, it, it's not gonna cause any damage. Um, so it's, it's all about uh, the amount of damage that, that a drone could potentially cause. But there is one rule in cars that um, is applicable to micro drones, and that is that no person shall operate a remotely piloted aircraft system in such a reckless or negligent matter, manner to, as to endanger or likely to endanger aviation safety or the safety of any person. Um, there are fines if you um, are flying your micro drone recklessly, um, up to $1,000 for individuals and $5,000 for corporations. Um, but you might be wondering, well, you know, like that's pretty, that's pretty wide. <laughs> um, like, what does that mean? I mean, obviously, you don't want to be going and flying off the tarmac at the airport. Um, you also don't want to be, you know, chasing cars or people with it. Um, that would fairly quickly be recognized as reckless or negligent. Um, but Transport Canada has put out some guidelines on, um, um, on what would be considered safe operation. So as a general rule of thumb with these machines, you want to maintain visual line of sight. Now, with the micro drones, you are not required to maintain visual line of sight. That's why a lot of people like to use them. You can, uh, you can fly further away. Um, but if you go flying outside of visual line of sight and then um, run into an aircraft, um, you may have some explaining to do. So just keep that in mind. You want to avoid flying above 400 feet above the ground. Um, again, because if we get the 
the closer we are to the surface, the less likely you are going to run into that uh, general aviation. Um, you want to keep a uh, safe distance laterally between yourself and drone, uh, the, uh, the drone and, and people, sorry, that uh, is not yourself. Um, you want to stay away from aerodromes, avoid flying near critical infrastructure, like don't take it into, you know, a hydroelectric dam or something like that. Um, stay clear of aircraft, make sure that you're checking your drone, make that it, all the parts are, are good before you fly. Um, Make sure that you don't fly so far away that you're going to lose your connection. Um, they are uh, radio frequency connections between the drone and the pilot, um, and those can be interrupted by uh, obstacles and um, just terrain in general. Um, so keep that in mind because uh, once you no longer have control of it, um, that can be a problem. Um, make sure you're following manufacturer's guidelines and avoid any special aviation event or any advertised event. Um, also, uh, there are two um, regulations that are not part of part nine that do apply to micro drones. Um, and that's actually in part six of the Canadian aviation uh, regulations um, and part of the aeronautics act as well. Um, and there are certain zones that you cannot fly even these machines. Um, so those would be uh, class F special use restricted airspace. Um, you know, your those types of airspace, and we'll go into it a little bit later, um, is stuff kind of around military airports, you know, if they're, or if, you know, you're near a mine where they're doing blasting and that sort of stuff. Anytime there's a reason that you need to be out of that area, weapons ranges, um, you need to stay out of those. Um, an important one for us, uh, airspace over forest fire uh, or area, any area that is located within five nautical miles of a forest fire area. Um, and any airspace for which a NOTAM, which is a notice to airman for forest fire um, aircraft has operating restrictions issued. Um, so we need to keep out of those areas, even if we're flying these small drones. Um, and then any zone where the uh, act restricts the use of the airspace to all aircraft. Um, so those are important to keep in mind. Um, from the 250 grams, our next uh, little category in terms of weight is 250 grams to 25 kilograms. Um, and any uh, drone in this uh, weight range, um, first of all, they're considered small RPAS and they need to be registered with Transport Canada. And in order to register an RPAS in Canada, you need to be at least 14 years of age, you need to be a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, uh, or you need to be a corporation incorporated under either territorial, provincial, or federal laws, um, or a municipal, provincial, or federal entity. Um, so those are the only people that can uh, register a drone in Canada. So if you are a foreign operator in Canada, we will get into it shortly. There are more steps that you need to take in order to fly your drone, even if it's in this weight class. So um, that 250 to uh, 25 kilograms, it's broken into two types of operations. And basically it, it's based on risk. We have basic operations and advanced operations. Um, so in order to complete basic operations, first of all, you need to be at least 14 years of age. So anyone under the age of 14, um, the only drones that they um, are allowed to fly are those micro drones, unless um, they are being supervised by someone that's at least 14 years old and has uh, this basic license. And uh, you must complete an examination as remotely piloted aircraft systems, basic operations uh, exam. And um, there, uh, there's one for basic and advanced. Um, and of course, it just gets more, uh, more in depth uh, for each level. Um, and then um, just because you've taken that exam once doesn't mean you're off scot-free there. Every 24 months, you need to make sure that you do a refresher of that information. There's a number of different ways that you can refresh um, your knowledge, um, and uh, that includes you can take the exam again. You can <clears throat> um, there's online courses that you can do, um, and there's a bunch of, of stuff that is uh, listed in this knowledge requirements on how you can can do that. Um, the thing about basic operations, as I mentioned, uh, they are the lower risk 
of the two. Um, so you need to be in what's called uncontrolled airspace, um, which I will go into. Um, you need to be at least three nautical miles from an aerodrome or one nautical mile from a heliport. And you need to keep yourself at least three, 30 meters or 100 feet uh, from bystanders. Um, so this doesn't include anybody that's part of your operation. If they're part of your operation, you can fly closer to them. But if there's somebody that's not part of your operation, uh, you need to keep at least 100 feet from them if you only have a basic operator certificate. Next, we have advanced operations. Um, for this one, you need to be 16 years of age um, and you need to complete the advanced operations exam. Uh, which is uh, significantly more difficult than the basic one, um, as well as a flight review. So uh, Transport Canada doesn't want to just know that you can answer a bunch of multiple choice questions. They also want to make sure that you know how to fly, but actually more importantly, they want to make sure that you have your processes um, in place. So making sure that you are uh, every time you're you're inspecting your drone, making sure that it's free from any uh, issues before you take off, uh, making sure that you have um, completed a site survey of your area. You know exactly what you're flying, what's there, what you need to avoid, what might cause problems. Also having emergency procedures. So if something goes wrong that you know, they know that you know um, how to deal with it, um, who to call um, and that sort of stuff. So that flight review portion is required uh, in order to get uh, an advanced operator's certificate. Um, and once you have that certificate, um, this will apply to operations in controlled airspace. So controlled airspace uh, would be usually uh, your areas uh, near um, uh, airports, um, large cities, tend to you know, have airports, uh, so they tend to be in controlled airspace, but there are some areas that, um, that are controlled airspace that uh, aren't cities, and hopefully we'll have time to look at that at the end if I don't ramble too much. Um, but you are allowed to go uh, a distance of less than 100 feet, um, but not less than 16.4 um, feet or 30 meters and five meters from another person, uh, except if they're a crew member. And that's measured horizontally at any altitude. So just because you're, um, you know, 60 meters in the air, um, it's still it's still measured uh, on a horizontal plane. Um, so just because you're 60 meters in the air, you're like, oh, I'm not anywhere. I'm not five meters near them. Um, just remember, this is about if that drone falls out of the sky, if you're going to hit anybody. Um, if you have an approved drone. Um, you can, that's, that's certified to uh, fly over people, then you can get in within that uh, five meter buffer around uh, bystanders. Um, but uh, as well, then if you want to fly within three nautical miles of the center of a, an airport or one nautical mile of the center of a heliport, you can do that with an advanced operations certificate. However, you do need to, um, do your due diligence and uh, uh, discuss the um, mission with whoever is controlling the aerodrome uh, to make sure uh, that everything is safe. Um, so uh, Transport Canada has a list of drones that are available uh, to use in advanced operations. Um, and this presentation I do plan to have available um, and it, but um, there is a list um, and they basically, uh, each manufacturer has to submit what's called a safety assurance. And that's them telling Transport Canada that we've tested this drone and we're confident uh, that the chance of it falling out of the sky or taking off in a wild and erratic manner, manner is pretty slim. Um, and they break those into three categories. So it can be um, submitted uh, to this list for controlled airspace uh, near people. So that's uh, less than um, 100 feet or 30 meters, but not uh, less than five meters or over people, which is the less than five meters. So if you're wanting to do an operation in any of those situations, you will want to check Transport Canada's list and make sure that the drone that you're planning to fly is allowed to, um, to be used in those situations. And if they're not on that list, um, 
then unfortunately uh, the drone is only allowed to be used for basic operations. So again, as a reminder, that's in uncontrolled airspace um, and far away from people and aer aerodromes. The next level up, so, you know, we talked about um, 250 grams uh, to 25 kilograms, and we talked about visual line of sight. Well, anything that doesn't fit in that neat box for basic or advanced operations, well, then we need what's called a special flight operations certificate or an SFOC. And there's a number of reasons you could need uh, an SFOC from Transport Canada. Um, I mentioned that um, if you're not a Canadian citizen or resident uh, or, you know, uh, incorporated in Canada, that you can't register your drone. So those would be your foreign pilots. Um, anytime a foreign pilot wants to fly any type of drone in Canada um, that's above 250 grams, uh, they will need to apply for this SFOC. Um, and, um, but that is considered a fairly low risk scenario uh, in terms of Transport Canada. Um, so the um, requirements um, to be granted that type of SFOC is uh, fairly um, simple, shall we say. There's not a lot to it, um, but there is some paperwork involved. And Transport Canada is working on um, a adjustment to some of their policies that hopefully in the future, um, foreign pilots uh, won't need to uh, go through quite so many hoops uh, to get that SFOC. But usually they do require that you are a certified pilot in your home country. So that is something important to know. Um, there are, however, some countries that do not have uh, regulations like Canada. Um, and so that gets a little bit, mm, but um, there are Transport Canada uh, inspectors on the drone side uh, that can work with people in those situations. Some of the higher risk environments um, that an SFOC is required for is a drone greater than 25 kilograms, like this beautiful Swiss drone that we have here in this picture, um, flying beyond visual line of sight, um, flying above 400 feet. Uh, if you're flying more than five, um, our pass at the same time from a single, single controller and it's near closer than five nautical miles to an aerodrome that's considered high risk um, and carrying dangerous or hazardous payloads so stuff like chemicals or anything like that um, those would require the uh, a more uh, in-depth SFOC um, and when we're talking about uh, SFOCs um, the higher risk environments are uh, also required to have um, what's called a SORA, which is a specific operational risk assessment. Um, so Transport Canada wants to make sure that you've looked at all the risks um, and anything that could possibly happen and that you're prepared for it is essentially what it comes down to. There are some lower risk environments, a little simpler to get. Um, but if you want to do any of these things, you will also need an SFOC. Um, so flying less than three nautical miles of a military aerodrome, uh, flying more than five hour pass at the same time from a single control station, but more than five nautical miles from an aerodrome. So like these beautiful drones uh, at the Olympics here, that would be something that would need a, an SFOC. Flying at any sort of advertised event. So if you're planning to put on an ad advertised event and you're inviting people, uh, you know, you're putting something on uh, social media saying, come one, come all. Um, if you want to fly there uh, with your with a drone, you are going to need an SFOC um, and any sort of special aviation event. Some of the basic uh, general operation and flight rules. Um, first of all, that you need to keep uh, that drone in line of sight. Um, there's two types of line of sight. Uh, one is visual line of sight, so unaided. That means um, without use of binoculars or any sort of telescope or anything like that's going to make the drone look bigger. So with uh, basically your naked eye being able to see that drone and the airspace around it, um, because that's one of the best ways to obviously avoid um, av other aviation. Um, losing any sight of your drone is prohibited, even if it's for a short amount of time. Um, and this can be done either through the use of the pilot themselves or 
um, which is a, always a great option, is using at least one what we call a visual observer. So someone to keep an eye on the drone. So if you have to take your eyes off of it for a bit um, to look at your controller, to adjust um, whatever camera you have, um, that you can do that while somebody is safely making sure that there are no air incursions there. Uh, there's also something to keep in mind that, that I touched on briefly, which is radio line of sight. Um, and that is just the ability of that link between the controller and the drone to function. And sometimes you can still see a drone, um, but due to interference, um, that radio line of sight uh, is, is compromised. So um, that's something that needs to be kept in mind as well. Um, and then one of the big things um, in what we're talking about here is emergency security perimeters. So this is um, what I kind of started off with at the beginning. So security perimeter is a place where public officials limit or restrict asset, uh, access. Um, so where caution or police perimeter tape has been erected or where there are first responders on the scene, um, those uh, we need to stay away from. Um, so when a public authority has established a security perimeter, um, our past uh, pilots are required to stay outside of the perimeter unless they are acting in the service of the public authority that created the perimeter, um, acting to save a human life or working with first responders such as police or fire authorities. Um, so from the articles I shared, this is kind of the big takeaway that we need to remember. Um, it's really important if you want to fly drones to learn all the regulations, get yourself up to speed on that, and then um, you know, get yourself um, in with one of these uh, public authorities that that are dealing with this type of thing. So, for example, if you have a passion for um, helping with wildfires, um, get yourself to the fire boss and, you know, discuss what you can do for them. Um, I will tell you that they're going to want to see you as an advanced pilot, someone with a lot of experience, because um, they're not just going to uh, want just anybody off the street coming in to help them, but go to them first uh, and discuss how you can you can help and uh, go from there. Um, we talked about airspace and I'm not going to go into a, a big detail about this, but that this is the main thing that is um, the difference between um, being able to fly in um, uh, basic operations versus advanced operations is that controlled airspace. Um, and there are a few different types of controlled airspace. Um, tight, uh, there, we, the, um, first, we have class A controlled airspace. That's for flying super duper high. A drone, for the most part, is not going to be flying up there. Those are, you know, when you're taking, um, you know, a flight from, from Calgary to Toronto, um, you're going to fly up in that area. Um, that's controlled. Um, then we have controlled low level airspace. We also, which is type B or class B airspace. Class C is around your large airports. Class D is your smaller airports and they usually still have, uh, you know, the, the uh, terminal uh, control there. And then you also have um, class E, which they don't usually have towers on them, um, but they're still controlled airspace during certain times. And controlled airspace just means there's someone there to, um, basically help uh, with traffic and making sure that that planes don't run into each other. Okay, um, so that's why we want to make sure to, uh, for the most part, keep our drones outside of those areas, um, because um, we have people that is their job to keep those aircraft stay, uh, safe. Um, they're uh, usually more densely, um, there's more, there's more aircraft traffic in those areas. Um, so um, that's why we have these people to look through this for us. Um, and when you do have that uh, advanced certificate, uh, NAV Canada in Canada is the one that uh, is responsible for doing that uh, separation in controlled airspace. So if you do want to fly in controlled airspace, you actually do have to request permission from NAV Canada, let them know where you're going to be flying, uh, what you're going to be doing, and they will provide you permission or not, depending on what it is that you want to do. Uh, we also have class F um, airspace. Uh, it is not, it can be controlled or uncontrolled, uh, depending, uh, it, it's, it, 
it's kind of an in-between. So sometimes basic operations can fly in uh, class F airspace um, and sometimes they can't. If it's class F airspace around military, no. If it's class F airspace because it's uh, aircraft uh, training area, then yes, with caution. Um, one last thing I just want to talk about is I briefly mentioned uh, NOTAMs, which are the notice to airmen. And these are what update pilots about hazards or changes in airspace. And the reason I want to bring these up is if you're ever wondering about where um, that airspace is closed around a wildfire, it will be listed in a NOTAM. Uh, so for example, uh, on Nav Canada's flight planning services, I actually just went in and went searching uh, to see if there were any active wildfires right now. Um, and there is. It will tell you um, what uh, what zone it's in. Um, uh, it will usually tell you the coordinates. Um, so you'll see that the restricted airspace is established when the, within the area bounded by these coordinates here. Um, and it'll tell you why. And it, it tells you that there is uh, aerial fire suppression in progress. So um, that would be how you can tell whether or not uh, an area has an active wildfire and whether you're not you're allowed to fly in that area. So just to end up uh, so that we can open it up to questions because I think I've seen some questions popping in, but you know, I talk a lot, so we'll leave those to the end. Um, drones are very useful uh, uh, and can be life-saving in disaster response, but they can also be a hindrance if the regulations aren't followed. Uh, so it's really integral to align yourself with the emergency management team uh, and incident, incident commanders want to work with people that know the regulations and that they'll follow them uh, because that's how they keep their crew safe. Um, large fines can and have been levied to those who don't follow the regulations. So don't be one of those people uh, that don't follow the regulations. Um, and then, like I said, I will share uh, this uh, copy of this presentation and I've got some links uh, if you want to check them out. So let's just stop sharing the screen there. And we got Michelle here with us. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was really well formed. And I think it gave a really good overview of the process and <laughs> the regulations that we work with almost every day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we do have a question from Frank. Um, he was wondering if there's a difference in regulation between drones that are operated by people or AI drones. So I think more specifically swarms. Uh, yes, and so we are definitely getting into, uh, it's obviously still fairly new technology. Um, currently in Canada, um, the re regulations are still state that um, up there needs to be uh, a pilot involved. There needs to be somebody, uh, a pilot in command is what we'll call them. Um, we can obviously have autonomous missions where a drone, we, we often call them drones in a box. They take off themselves, fly a pre-planned route, um, do their thing and come back um, without um, necessarily someone needing to be on the sticks. Um, those are uh, definitely uh, gaining popularity. Um, unfortunately, as of now, Transport Canada's regulations um, require that there be somebody in charge of that. So even if you have um, somebody, even if you're doing this type of operation, there is going to need to be somebody on site um, that is acting as that uh, visual observer um, and is overall in charge of what is happening with that drone. Mm -hmm. So a follow-up question from Frank is, um, he says, that's the problem spot on because the systems I saw had a mission planner, not a pilot. So I guess you just- yes. <laughs> And, you know, um, I know I'm heading to a conference in Ottawa uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, and I, I am part of the regulatory committee for our national kind of federation on, on our pass stuff uh, uh, is called Aerial Evolution Association of Canada and I am part of their regulatory committee and I know that that is one thing that we do plan because Transport Canada is going to be at our conference the beginning of November and it's one thing that uh, we do uh, plan on bringing up. Transport Canada does have in the works um, and they've been very upfront 
about it um, on BV loss regulations um, and wanting to make it easier for um, people to complete BV loss operations uh, in low risk environments. And those new regulations should hopefully be coming uh, 2025, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's always, a, you know, they always, it, it often gets pushed back, but that's the hope is that these new regulations will be coming in. Uh, and when they do um, stuff uh, like you're talking about, will um, definitely be able to be more uh, likely to be in that framework because you won't need to have that person um, there. Um, I mean, right now you can get a special flight operations certificate uh, if you can prove that the system is fairly foolproof and has a very good uh, what Transport Canada calls detect and avoid. That's the big thing for doing beyond visual line of sight operations is being able to see the other, other aircraft uh, and avoiding them. Um, but I, I think in the future, for sure, it, they're going to be loosening up regulations um, and they have to. Um, it, it's just the way that the technology is going, right? Perfect, thank you. Um, so another question we have from Mina, and she put it here in the chat. Um, she's wondering what is the maximum elevation a drone can and is allowed to fly? Yeah, so it's <laughs> the current uh, regulations um, are 400 feet, um, so uh, or 120 meters if you want to do meters. Um, you know, in Canada we do both. Um, however. If you want to fly higher than that, of course, uh, there is the option of special flight operation certificates, um, which we have done numerous times in the past. Um, what you'll often have an issue with, with that uh, 400 feet limit is, and uh, Mina, I know in your case, you know, when we're looking at like river valleys, if we take off from the top of a river valley um, and, uh, all of a sudden we go, we're, we're fine, we're up here, um, we go flying over that valley and the valley just drops out from underneath us. Well, it's 400 feet from what's below the drone. So if, uh, even if you started way up on the hill, um, if that valley drops out below you, it's only 400 feet from that low point, um, which can be difficult. Uh, and I have hel helped a few of our industry partners um, obtain special flight operation certificates for situations like that, um, because there is uh, that ability to say, well, you know, like, look, we're not going to have uh, crude aviation flying in this river valley. Now, that's not always the case sometimes. I mean, you know, we get we get helicopters and stuff in there. But if you can if you can prove that uh, you can do it safely, um, Transport Canada will will ap approve um, that higher limit. Yeah, great, great answer. Thank you for your question. Um, the question box is still open if anyone has more questions, but I guess I'll ask you to speak on this because you have so much experience um, obtaining these permissions and, and SFOCs from Transport Canada. Do you find that they're generally very open to research um, proposals for like um, for applying permissions? Do you find that these rules are more for uh, the clueless, the careless, and the criminal, as they say? <laughs> or do you think they're more open to the general? If you are genuinely trying to fly for a purpose, they're more willing to kind of understand what the purpose is and let you do it. Yeah, you always kind of worry when you're talking about a government organization, right? And and how are what are they are they trying to prevent you from doing anything, or or are they trying to just kind of get rid of those yes like as you mentioned um the great thing about the rpas task force with transport canada is they are generally or not generally genuinely interested in helping um anybody really kind of they, they're not trying to to stifle you and you know they, they just want things to be safe um, like I, we've mentioned, I have a very good relationship with our uh, regional inspector, and that's just come from years of, you know, I, I've submitted a lot of these SFOCs, um, you know, and, and they're, they're very open for conversations. I've had, I've brought them in on conversations with some of our large 
uh, drone manufacturers to like, what do we need to do to get this to work, right? Um, so they're very, very helpful and they're always willing to uh, just chat about something if you have an idea and they're, they're great with the research. They've been really wonderful for us, um, but it does um, come down to the fact that um, we have been flying um, with it very well within those regulations and respecting boundaries and doing what we need to do and having safe flights for a, a number of years. And so um, I think that we probably get, um, you know, when they see an application from SAIT, they're going to say, oh, you know, we know that they that they're they're doing everything that they need to do. But they did actually earlier this year come and audit us. And that's what they are planning to do with everybody that holds an SFOC in mm -hmm. Canada. They audit you uh, to, to just get a physical feeling of whether or not you truly understand the stuff that you've put in your SFOC and whether you're following what you said you're gonna follow. Um, and once you know, you've know you kind of passed that test, then they're even, I find that they're even more willing to kind of give you some more uh, leeway. That's great, yeah. <laughs> That's a good heads up to everyone. Mm -hmm. Audits can come in any time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so we have another question. Um, this one's about load bearing drones. So it's one thing to have a camera, but there might be an active load too. So for example, putting a fire extinguisher or other funny things on top of a drone. Um, in Frank's view, it definitely changes the danger. And is there a difference in regulations? Um, the big thing about having payloads on drones, no matter what it is, is that it needs, if the drone, okay, if we're in that 250 to 25 kilogram range where I mentioned that they need to have that safety assurance with Transport Canada. Um, if you adjust anything from what the manufacturer has said, this is our drone, we've tested it like this um, and it's safe. If you modify anything that might adjust the flight characteristics of the drone, um, you've essentially created a new drone. So you either have to have the approval from the manufacturer for anything that you're strapped onto this thing. And if you haven't, then you need to either certify that this drone is safe as you've, as you've adjusted it, or um, you are allowed to fly it in basic operations. So not in, in um, downtown Toronto. Um, but uh, the, that, doesn't, that doesn't prevent you from doing it. We strap all sorts of crazy things to our drones. Um, some of our bigger drones, like our Swiss drones, and we have uh, someone from Swiss drones on the call. Um, when we want to, to uh, strap anything crazy on it, we, we contact them and say like, you know, and making sure that our, our uh, center of gravity is good and all that sort of stuff and making sure that it's not going to uh, change the flight characteristics of the drone itself. Um, but of course, if you're talking like a DJI drone, um, you're not gonna probably be able to get in touch with anybody from there um, to, to get that permission. And, and in which case um, you just, you need to fly either in uncontrolled airspace or, or perform those um, tests to make sure that it's safe. But you can, you can put all sorts of, we've, we've dropped uh, ping pong balls uh, out, of, out of drones for you know, um, golf tournaments. You, you can do all sorts of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the sky's the limit <laughs> yeah the dynamite you know we've had a little bit more pushback on but we're working on it <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> great thank you I think we're pretty much done on our timing here I think Francesca wanted to do some closing remarks so I'll let him jump on but um yeah if anyone has any questions later on feel free to email um Stephanie I can type your email address in this chat and mm -hmm. Yeah, we're always open to questions and thank you so much for coming and I'll leave it up to you, Francesco. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, yeah, I just want to give a quick thanks to you, Stephanie, for that great presentation um, and for taking the time to answer all of the audience questions. Thank you, Michelle, for um, helping put together this whole series um, as well as moderating the session. Um, and thank you as well to uh, Wade from SAIT for, uh, for his support in this whole series as well. Um, and of course, thank you to everybody in the audience for taking the time to join us um, and for being here for the presentation, interacting, commenting, asking questions. Um, we, we always like to see that kind of interaction to um, just to, to see people uh, really engaging with the content that we're, 
that we're helping to provide. So it's it's always great to see. So thank you all for that. Um, and then just as a quick reminder, this is a monthly series. Um, so the next session will be in November on the 21st. Um, and it will be a presentation by Clifton Cross, who is from the Frog Lake First Nations. Um, so if that is of interest to you, please put that on your calendars and feel free to keep sharing the recording of this video, which will be up in the next couple of hours on our YouTube channel. Um, and share the registration link within your networks as well, our registration for this. And all of our speaker series is always open and free. Um, and so with that, just one last big thank you to everybody for being here. Um, it was a great session and a great way to open this speaker series. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Bye. everyone.